Okay, hi everybody. Hi, so hello. Just gonna let a couple of people join in the live and then we will get started. Um, so anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Amanda Pooley and I am Deputy Editor at Professional Beauty. And today we're gonna be talking with the amazing Sharma Dean Reed. Um, so she is the owner of Beauty Stat, which is a software company for the beauty industry, but also she is a member of the British Beauty Council and she has been campaigning tirelessly for the beauty industry during coronavirus lockdown and beyond. And she's gonna be talking today about getting the beauty industry the respect that it deserves and how we can do that in the short term and the long term, because I think this whole situation has just shown us how little kind of the government really understands beauty. So I'm gonna bring her in now and we will get going. Um, cool should be coming in any second now. Thanks, Shah, I've just seen your request, so it should be bringing you in. Okay. Hopefully it's connecting. Hi. Hello. <laughs> You're right, Shah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh. I'm good, how are you? Busy. Yeah. yeah, it's been a bit of a crazy year, hasn't it? 2020 has been completely unpredictable. Um, <laughs> predictable but I also think that you know the way the world was going was quite specific and this is just a chance to shape things up I think yeah definitely so I was just saying a little bit to people before I brought you in that we're going to be talking today about getting the beauty industry the respect it deserves kind of in the short term and the long term um but just before we kind of get onto that subject, obviously the return of face treatments, which we found out at the end of last week is like really brilliant news for the industry. But why do you think it took so long for that to happen? And what do you think it was that eventually kind of got beauty back? I think it took a while for face treatments to come back because I think that our government has been, um, you know, trying to deal with a pandemic but also with things that they have no idea about how our industry operates you know so they're dealing with complete unknowns while trying to please everybody and i just think that the beauty industry doesn't have as much lobbying power as other industries such as the alcohol industry um you know all the mm. restaurant industry you've got to remember that these industries come back because there are groups and organizations that are constantly banging on the on the doors of government so yeah i think that the people who are in power have little understanding of how our industry actually works um i think that that was it that was an issue yeah i you know i think that's completely true i think the government doesn't really understand the complexity of the sector either and i think that's been shown with a lot of kind of the language they've used and things like that i mean how do you think that we can get the industry the respect it deserves from government in the short term and in the long term well i think that the british beauty council is doing a lot of work with that one of its pillars is around reputation but if i'm honest it's it's cultural i think it's completely cultural and it starts from a really young age and i think it starts from education i think that historically there's always been this kind of derision of anyone who wanted to go into the beauty industry as oh well you know you couldn't do a real job or you you know you couldn't like get x amount of qualifications when Actually, the beauty industry is flexible, safe, social, creative, satisfying work. And I think there needs to be an understanding that there are many, many paths for different people. And in actual fact, all paths are respected. Definitely. I think that's so true. I but think that, that, that to me needs to literally start from education. So I'm talking about, you know, at B tech level, when people mm -hmm. start doing their beauty. Qualifications, 
justifications that they don't feel that they're an outsider or a minority or a failure. It needs to be that, no, you know, this is an alternative vocation. There's just many different paths. And, and I would say that that applies to all trade professions, actually, not just beauty. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't be this thing whereby people are like, oh, if I want to do carpentry or crafts or art, you know, if I want to do something very... Um, physical and manual with my hands as opposed to a white collar and I'm in the tech industry so there's this thing whereby everyone's always like oh everyone needs digital skills in tech and I'm like if we all did that <laughs> then literally we would have no society like you know don't basically put all your eggs in one vocational basket respect everyone's profession equally yeah, I think everything you said there is so well said and so many people were agreeing because I think so much of it does come down to education and beauty being seen as a really viable career choice and actually us being able to show the breadth of the career opportunities that you can have in beauty. Um, I do remember talking to a salon owner not too long ago and she said that when she started and she was in college, they were always being told that they needed to go work on a cruise ship and that was kind of the only kind of key yeah. career option. So. I think all of this is so true. We just really need to shout about how great the industry is and really showcase the opportunities that lie within it. And also that it's like really well paid as well. I have a lot of um, people who sign up to Beauty Stat because they don't want to, there might be students, you know, they've done their qualifications and they don't actually want to work in a pub or in Topshop, you know, mm. they don't want to do like, work till two in the morning getting like shouted at by guys in a bar you know and they will earn more money if not minimum the same money as their um you know co-workers or co or sh fellow students who are doing like what's seen as normal kind of part-time career paths mm. fact is we're about to enter a recession and i think there'll be lots and lots of um requirements for alternative methods of income that's flexible and safe and i just think beauty is an incredible path for that mm. and um just going back to this kind of thing of the government having a good understanding of the industry some people in the industry feel like mps have a greater understanding or even more respect for the hair sector than beauty do you agree with this and why do you think this kind of perception exists I just think it's because government is largely male and you can't, not you can't because you can, but it's harder work to understand what you don't know. Um, you know, if I was to go into like the sports industry, I might not know all the careers like within a football team. You know what I mean? <laughs> I might be like, oh, there's a football manager. That's what exists within a football team. But I don't know that there are, you know physiotherapists or agents or all these other careers within the industry of football it's it's like a reverse and similar thing they might know oh a barber okay i get what a barber is or a hairdresser does but they wouldn't know all of the finer details of you know people who do brows and lashes mm -hmm. and i hate to um i hate to say it but part of the treatments that they don't truly understand are the ones that women don't really talk about as much so it's almost like i woke up like this not that i've had yeah. extensions my eyebrows my <laughs> you know so they mm. don't even know it um you know it's quite clear that your hair is dyed but mm. it's not clear that i've had eyelash extensions in yeah they just don't <laughs> um the other thing i think is that I mean, for me with government, I've never been the type of person to expect anybody else to change anything for me. My methodology has always been, well, actually, you become successful in your industry and you gain power because you have been successful. So what I think is important for the industry to show is the economic value of the industry and how, you know, we are going to be a legitimate way to pull people out of a recession. And I think when you gather collectively as individuals, that's to me when you've got power what, rather than individuals trying to explain to an MP what microblading is. Yeah. 
And, you know, before the pandemic, have you ever experienced a kind of lack of understanding from peers in other sectors about the work you do in beauty? And if so, are you able to tell us about some of those experiences? I actually haven't because I think what, what the work I did was always incredibly clear. Like mm. we did nails, it's very visual. You can clearly mm. see like what it was. I think trying to educate people about the importance and the value of it was probably a bit challenging, but not really, because I always just had a good story to sell it. I think everybody needs to work on what their personal story is and nail that narrative down. So mm -hmm. it's not, you know, it goes back to what I said earlier, that the narrative might, the narrative is not, you know, I went to college and I failed all my A-levels, therefore I did beauty. The narrative becomes, I always wanted to work in beauty therapy and I designed my career to do exactly the kind of work that I want to do. And I think that from the get-go with War Nails and now with Beauty Stack, I was always very, very clear about the narrative and the intention of what I want to do. So no one really misjudged that. Mm. It was quite obvious, but I come at it from a different point of view because I'd always be presenting it as, the, as a business proposition. Yeah. But I'm also kind of ilk where if people, um, if people don't get what I do, I don't really care about, um, you know, trying to persuade them. I'm like, there's always more eyeballs. Mm. I think that's know? like a really good attitude to have about it as well, because I guess as long as you sort of believe in what you're doing, and you have the confidence with it. Um, having one person not really understanding your story, if you can get uh, many other people to understand it, it doesn't matter too much, does it? Precisely. And obviously you're a key member of the British Beauty Council and they've been really vital for the industry during the pandemic. Um, are there any developments or campaigns that you know people in the beauty industry should be aware of at the moment um, that you guys are working on or is there anything that people can get involved with? I think the most important thing is to just sign up to the British Beauty Council because there's so much going on um, over the next like from September when things start to kind of resume after summer that mm -hmm. if you sign up to be a member of the British Beauty Council you'll have access to all of the events so I think right now the most important thing is to sign up and then you'll be in the various tracks. Um, we're working on something really, really exciting, a preview of what the British Beauty Week will be next year um, with lots of talks in September, October time. So, yeah, if you sign up, you'll get oh, to know when those tickets are live. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. And obviously, you know, in terms of getting the industry the respect it deserves, there's obviously much broader, wider campaigns that have been happening during lockdown and past it. But is there anything that, you know, salon spa owners and mobile therapists and techs and stuff can do on a sort of smaller, more localised basis to keep this kind of momentum of change going in 2020 and helping the industry get more respect? Like, is there anything they can do on a smaller level? Sorry, someone beeping outside my house. <laughs> um, on a smaller level, I really believe that it's just important that we band together and support each other. I think one of the questions I often get asked actually in the past was around um, beauty professionals being competitive with each other. And I would have to explain that that's not really how our industry works. People are very yeah. supportive of each other. So... Um, you know, the brilliant campaigns that have been going on during the pandemic with Why Can't I Work, with Telegraph, we did Beauty Back and then Caroline mm. did her um, Beauty Back. I think that it just shows that we care and support about each other. But the danger is you don't want to become an echo chamber, right? Mm. You only be talking to the beauty industry. So the most... You know, I just keep repeating this at length, but the most powerful thing you can do right now is be successful in your business. Literally, that's it. The most powerful thing you can do right now is to not go out of business, is to figure out how you're going to recoup all your lost earnings and essentially to rebuild your relationship with your clients and with your fellow beauty professionals because that that is the most powerful thing that an individual can do right now. 
like with beauty stack we always just keep telling everybody like list your business with us because we're going to be another avenue for you to be able to earn more money and that's my only priority i i only care i think about it right the energy you expend trying to lobby the government if you spend that energy on your own business, you would have the power and freedom to then have the opportunity to be able to go and lobby government. But it's almost like one, you know, one of my favorite phrases is like, you can't pour fake. Um, it's important for you to build up your personal power, economic independence, economic freedom for you to be able to then go and do other things for the industry. Like, over lockdown for me it we did so much activity it was unreal like it was one of the most exhausting periods of my life which is like we were constantly talking to pros to just make sure that everyone felt okay and happy and you know mm. people were always um there'd always be some who'd slip through the net and i would just be like checking in are you are you still working are you still taking bookings etc because that no one's gonna help you like i'm just like help yourself you know what i mean mm. that's an amazing idea an incentive scheme like the eat out to help out um i think that's an absolute brilliant idea and it also goes back to what i said about the lobbying power of the restaurant industry like the restaurant industry has a campaign like yeah. i don't know what our version is and you know i'm sure that the team back in beauty start can brainstorm one and think about it <laughs> like exactly that it's like spend your time like working on rebuilding your business because at the end of the day nobody else is going to be there for you given mm. what by the government they you know they don't provide furlough for individuals they mm. um because they're self-employed like to me there's so many people in the beauty industry who are part of that um what's it called the three million excluded excluded yeah. hey did you see that mm. like you've been in self-employment for less than three years you've you know not got tax returns and you're not an employee and mm. therefore you get nothing from the government so i just think focus on your business build your relationship with your clients and i will try and think of a eat out mm. to have <laughs> the beauty because that's a brilliant idea thank you yeah, there is a petition at the moment by um, a woman called Rhea Jane Lincoln. She used to be a lash artist and now she's an accountant. And she's actually um, created a petition to get a scheme like that. So something where people do get a discount and the government pays for half to try and get people to go back to salons and spas and see mobile therapists. And obviously there's other petitions and stuff going on at the moment about trying to get the beauty industry a VAT cut and things like that. I mean, what do you think will be the key to the sector's recovery because obviously the industry does contribute a lot um to gdp and i think the industry will recover but is there anything that you think is really going to actually help beauty get back on its feet and you know pretty much back in the green do you know what i think it should be is the insurance company should pay out for lost earnings i think that the um government has not asked the insurance companies to pay up and so many people who have mm -hmm. adequate cover have basically been left out of pocket. I think if the insurance companies were able to pay, um, similarly to the, uh, you know, small business grants where it's like an average of what your average monthly earnings would be, nobody's talking about the insurance companies. And I'm like, why are the insurance companies getting away with that? Mm -hmm. Most policies have business interruption clauses and this is a huge business interruption and yet they're just literally like washing their hands of it and being like mm -hmm. oh well there's nothing we can do here i'm like we so why have i been paying my premiums someone needs to get <laughs> yeah and like be like the insurance companies need to pay up it's been five or six months now and they should actively be paying a lump sum payout for yeah. Absolutely. And actually, I was even speaking to a clinic only the other day, and she was saying that um, she had £3,000 worth of stock that went off during lockdown, and she hasn't been recouped for it. But pubs obviously had to pour down drinks and stuff which had gone off in the time, and they've actually been recouped 
for that kind of loss. And so it does feel like there's a sense of unfairness in it all. Um, so it is, it is difficult. Um, but yeah, I just, I think it as well, because you were talking about um, the people who had kind of slipped through the gap, the self-employed who weren't able to get money from government. Do you know of any kind of financial support that these people can get? I know we've spoken about Caroline's um, Beauty Backed, which has been amazing, um, raising money through the hair and beauty charity and stuff. But is there any other kind of schemes or resources that you know that could really help these people out? I haven't actually seen any. There is one charity that is a beauty, hair and beauty fund um, for when they've fallen on hard times. Um, obviously, Caroline's one, which I don't know how it's working with the payouts and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually haven't seen any. And I think that, how can I say, I just, I just think it's a bit crap that we have to like organise ourselves around this. Like, mm. what's the point in paying tax? What, what is the point in paying your... I don't understand. Why am I paying in to insurance, to council tax, business rates, VAT? Why am I paying all of this stuff? Like, I just think it's not really, really cool. But mm. to answer your question, I haven't... Seen it. I just think that that's... Um, why I'm so focused on help, helping yourself. I think there should be campaigns for sure. I think there should the government should p put pressure on the insurance companies, and I think the government should make a pot of money where the beauty industry, which is like the last of the industries, <laughs> like it's so <laughs> weird. I know. Like put a pot of money aside that we can apply for grants for, and I'm not talking mm -hmm. loans for what we've got to we've got to basically work less a loan right now to a bureau like a credit card at like 120 percent like you know mm. interest rate mm. like we would be paddling like trying to keep head above water the whole time i just think it's pointless yeah and what you said as well about actually getting grants rather than loans there's a clear difference there in the type of help that you can get and it does seem silly that we're the last industry to go back and it feels like the last industry to really get that extra support and that extra help. Yeah. Um, which I'll, I'll just never really understand that. Um, but obviously so many people who work in the industry as well are worried about a potential second wave of the virus occurring, mm -hmm. especially with all these kind of local lockdowns happening and stuff. Do you have any advice on how these kind of business owners could sort of future proof their businesses in case something like this does happen this is a fantastic question and this has actually been what's preoccupying my mind for the last few weeks which is why i've probably been out of the loop of like all of the campaigning that's going on because i'm just like mm -hmm. campaigning that we did you know push they, they were scared of being called sexist and misogynistic they gave us a little bit of bread crumbing saying that it could be open august the first then they pushed it back it's all mm -hmm. I'm just like, we need to look after ourselves. And to me, future proof in your business is being incredibly diligent about your client relationships. Remember that beauty professionals. There's two, two things that I'm going to tell you before we wrap up. The first thing is that remember as beauty professionals, you only need like five to eight clients a day. You are, that's all you need so actually rather than focusing on trying to get like thousands of followers or likes or whatever who cares make a list of 200 of your clients over the last like few years and text and telephone every single one and start building an, a very very direct personal relationship with your clients to encourage that loyalty that's going to ensure that your book is always full that's like critical mm -hmm. the second one is which is like, I'm so excited that we're working on this for Beauty Stag, is events programming, virtual workshops. So what we're building right now is the ability for a beauty pro to host a masterclass, a workshop, any kind of ticketed event on Beauty Stag, like you sell your tickets through Beauty Stag, because what we did for our pros over lockdown was essentially help them do virtual events. Mm -hmm. We didn't really do Instagram lives because the pros couldn't get paid. I was mm -hmm. preoccupied with what can you do that I can sell a ticket for? We were doing it on Eventbrite and then hosting the events on Zoom. 
And that way you would be earning money during lockdown. And I think second wave, you need to nail your virtual events, your virtual classes, your master classes. It might be a master class to five people. It might be a seminar for 5,000 people. But the fact is that will guarantee that you can work and operate if a second wave comes. And I'm really excited that we're building those tools right now because Eventbrite take a huge... Um, they do, don't they? On, yeah. You know, we paid Eventbrite thousands over. Mm. And, and I was like, actually... The other, the reason why you pay Eventbrite the fee is because you believe that you're going to get um, marketed, you're going to be shared within their network. But actually, a beauty and wellness specific and business, because obviously our business events do really well. But a mm. beauty, wellness, and business specific ticketing platform, I think, is like really, really critical right now to ensure that you can earn more money because a woman. Mm is doing like lashes who has a glass ceiling of you know let's say it's 500 pounds a day on earnings if you did a lash course you could be earning like 500 pounds an hour like mm. ticket so you know our mission is always to be economically empower women so i'm just looking for new solutions all the time to do that and i think mm. that you know our group booking feature will will be really exciting for the industry yeah, I mean, I think that's such great advice because there was so much emphasis on digital services, wasn't there, during lockdown? And actually, the appetite is still there for these workshops, these masterclasses. So it's really about honing those skills and developing that aspect of your business so that if there is another lockdown or you're in a localised lockdown, it's another way of getting revenue into your business and keeping you afloat. I mean, you were saying about your platform, is that kind of ready now or do you know oh, we're literally building it right now so if you host uh if you do an event we can promote it on beauty stack but right now you can't sell tickets through beauty stack yeah so building is a ticketing platform for beauty and wellness events so that beauty professionals can host their own events on our platform so it's mm -hmm. not like the video and stuff you'll still use zoom or google hangouts or microsoft teams or whatever it is that you're using mm. but you can sell your tickets directly to our client base and i think hey alicia <laughs> uh, that's that's what's going to be really exciting about the industry next yeah and i think that is really in interesting as well because like you said eventbrite do take a massive chunk um when you use them so i think anything where it can help businesses and it's not taking as much that's going to be brilliant but obviously that's not the only thing that you've been working on at the moment um you're launching the beauty stat podcast which aims to promote the work of mobile beauty therapists could you tell us a little bit more about that as well so what the podcast actually does it's it interviews my friends who are influencers and ceos and founders and helps people understand that beauty professionals are critical to allow powerful women to do their job so it's like we're not interviewing beauty professionals we're not you know we're not interviewing people in the beauty industry i'm interviewing like models who say here's all the people that keep me sane here's all the people who look help me look me look like how i look and it's essentially part of our remit to promote the beauty professional as an essential member of society like they're the people behind the people do you know what i mean yeah, they're yeah. behind the famous people so we're not interviewing beauty people on the podcast it's called my beauty stack which is like who what's your stack from your head to your toe like, <laughs> yeah. they're, they're like all the people that keep you looking like you and i just think it's a way to give outreach you know, to a wider community. So it's not actually mm. musicians, it's aimed at any woman who is a fan of, you know, that, <laughs> the, the guest. Any woman who's a fan of the guest will be like, oh, okay, so that's how she, that's where she gets her hair done. That's why mm -hmm. she, like people are always like, um, they look at people on social media and they assume that that's how they really are. And it's like, that's <laughs> yeah. not how Really are. No. Like, you know, there's there's this literally glam squad i hate that phrase mm. glam squad, but there's literally a squad of people keeping you looking like you so yeah, yeah. isn't my skin so good <laughs> I 
tanned, and B, I've just not been wearing makeup. I've got mm. one little spot actually today, but it's just because I've not been wearing makeup for so long. Mm. And actually, someone did say you for prime minister as well. That's <laughs> um, but I think a dresser. She keeps my hair looking good. Um, yeah, but this is what I mean. We've all got people that we use. And like you say, these people, they've got a whole team behind them. So it's kind of pulling the curtain back and letting people know actually who's helping these people look the way that they do. Because I do think with social, um, like you said, people think people look like that all the time. And it's just not real, is it really? Um, a lot of work goes into it. So I think it would be really great. I mean, is the podcast live now or is it launching soon? The podcast is live right now on Spotify and iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and then the ticketing platform will be ready in about October time, just in time for winter. So yeah, thank you so much, guys. <laughs> just before we go, Shah, somebody's asked where you get your hair done. <laughs> I get my by Alicia Dobson at Bleach. It's just all natural right now, oiled back with, um, you know, products and oils and stuff. But I always get my hair done by Alicia Dobson at Bleach Brixton. <laughs> well, Shah, thank you so much. This has been really interesting. I always love talking to you and you always have really good insights into what we can do to keep evolving the industry and kind of making it better. And I know you're super busy, so I really appreciate you taking the time out and do stay in touch with anything you're kind of working on. And I look forward to seeing the events platform launching. Thank you so much. There's no worries. Thanks so much, Shah. Speak soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.